It was May 1991. I was in college in the bassist with a rock group called Eskimo Sunburn. <laughs> Our ambitious lead singer responded to a Department of Defense advertisement in Rolling Stone magazine, and within weeks, a DOD talent scout sat through our show. At the end of the night, she offered us a chance to play music for the United States and Allied troops in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait during the cleanup phase of Operation Desert Storm. The band had already discussed this possibility and accepted. She explained our next steps, but I couldn't focus on her instructions because I felt overwhelmed and then ashamed. I attempted to listen, but was swept away by the feelings, which had become automatic for me in any uncertain situation. And the feelings brought me back to when I was five years old and tried to bond with my dad at his workbench on Saturday mornings. I didn't understand what he was doing, and there were so many tools, but being overwhelmed was eclipsed by my desire to be near him. His solution was to let me hold a hammer for him while I stood as close to him as he'd let me. Over and over, I inched towards him and offered up the hammer, always at the wrong times, <laughs> and eventually got in his way. Over and over, he told me to step back. I felt a combination of shame for having bothered him and a deep desire for him to hold me. Each time, I could only say, I'm sorry. I snapped back to reality when I heard the band asking questions about our trip, and I started worrying. I couldn't imagine that I was really helping the military, or what an honor this opportunity was, only that I might suffer somehow. To avoid facing my distress, I mocked the well-mannered music scout with the crisp uniform by standing in an overly stiff posture behind her back and gave ridiculous answers to her required questions. Have you ever been convicted of a crime, she asked me. Convicted? Never, I answered with a cheesy grin as the guys in the band shook their heads and whispered, cut the shit, man. <laughs> Before our departure from Dover Air Force Base, we were told what to expect overseas, including the unnerving news that while off base, we'd be under Saudi and Kuwaiti law, not American military law. Some direct quotes. Don't steal. That stuff about hands being taken off isn't an urban legend. Don't even look at women. Other things might get cut off. Seriously, don't possess alcohol, drink it, or even have it on your breath. That could carry the heaviest punishment you can imagine. I couldn't think about this trip as an adventure or be grateful the military was taking care of everything except our performances. I was terrified that I might suffer an injustice, like being beaten by the Saudis' infamous morality police because a soldier spilled beer on me at an off-base event. As usual, when I felt overwhelmed, I thought of my dad and wanted to talk to him. I was bitter that I couldn't and held it against the balding officer dishing out all that bad news. The more he talked about the dangers we faced, the more I mocked the officer's bald spot to myself. Eskimo sunburn toured the Middle East from July 22nd to August 20th. Of all our shows, the most memorable for me was in a tiny officer's club. It was the only structure for about 200 miles. The band was greeted by a Marine with acres of medals on his chest. Based on the hardware alone, he was the most courageous person I'd met in years. He overlooked our long and unkempt hair, torn and dirty jeans, and showed us around the place as though giving a tour to his commanding officer. He looked each of us in the eyes as he told us how much he appreciated our contribution to the military effort. He praised our willingness to sacrifice all the fun of summer parties in college in order to entertain the troops under his command. I couldn't resist softening under his grace and humility. He asked if any of us had family in the military or were considering joining ourselves. The rest of the band responded no, but I mentioned that my parents and uncles on both sides were in various branches and that I'd been ROTC until 10 months earlier when I realized I was only following that path to make my mom happy. I didn't tell him that I still, almost a year later, wondered how disappointed my dad would have been that I quit. He was moved by my answer and offered me a Marine recruiting poster to seal our bond. <laughs> the band's singer scoffed because obviously none of us was enlisting anytime soon. 
The rest of us, including me, echoed his snarky reply, but I found myself staring at that poster and missing home. I pictured my dad, who met my mom, an army nurse at the time, after breaking his foot chasing an ice cream truck during basic training. <laughs> she was the only person who ever beat him in Scrabble, and he couldn't help but propose. He died when I was seven. A combination of cancer and a double pneumonia that collapsed his lungs. The memory of watching his casket go into the ground put me back in touch with the ache that had lived in my heart since then. I tried not to think about the times I'd most missed him. My original comedy sketch in fifth grade. My first date with Kim. Senior wrestling season with a 19 and one record. High school graduation. And I felt the emptiness of his absence from all those moments. To escape that internal torture, I thought about the older woman I'd started dating just a week before my overseas adventure began. She attended one of our shows with a mutual friend. She playfully prodded me to look her in the eyes rather than at the ground when I spoke to her. By the end of the night, I asked her out, but had the feeling that she had arranged for me to do it. I was knocked out of my trance by our drummer who yelled, you still thinking about joining the Marines? I laughed but stole a glance at our host to make sure I hadn't offended him. While the band set up, guests with heavily decorated uniforms arrived and greeted one another. Always in English, but the accents betrayed Brits, Irish, French, Aussies, and a Scot. I mostly remember the Scot. He was a foot shorter than me and built like... Imagine how a five foot tall lad named Angus McKenzie but nicknamed Mick Backbuckler might be shaped. <laughs> he approached me and said, Laddie, with those green eyes and ruddy cheeks, you must be a Scotsman. He was halfway through his drink. I wondered if it was his first. He must have noticed my hesitation because he said with a little annoyance, oh, your people are from there. Even if you're not, you've got Scottish blood. I smiled and agreed that I did. He asked for details. I told him my dad's people had been the Fitz Stevens clan before they dropped the Fitz at Ellis Island in the 1880s. He was so excited that he put me in a headlock <laughs> and yelled, I knew it. I knew I'd find a noble soul here. <laughs> While I recovered from the shock of our brief but one-sided wrestling match, this McBackbuckler fellow ranted about details of life in Glasgow I couldn't possibly use which haggis shop I should avoid because the owner dated his sister once. This said with a lone finger raised as though warning me that if I chose to date any relation of his, I'd better take her out at least twice. <laughs> Lieutenant McBackbuckler, I wasn't clear on his rank, lectured me about how one of the organists at the Catholic church he attended was not in great form and therefore which Catholic mass to avoid on Sundays and Wednesdays, of course. After providing 15 of the most entertaining minutes of my life, Major McBackbuckler, again, I wasn't clear on his rank, <laughs> demanded I have a drink with him. I told him I was just about to go on stage and that we'd catch up later. In truth, I wasn't about to test the no drinking booze rule and hoped he might just forget about the whole thing if I put him off long enough. Colonel McBackbuckler was waiting for me at the end of the first set. Come on, laddie, and let's have that drink, he said as he ushered me towards the open bar. I hesitated. I'm sorry, sir, but I've got a few more sets to play and need to keep a steady hand, so I'm gonna stay sober for now. I repeated this delaying tactic after the second and third sets. The band was scheduled to play five. General McBackbuckler was standing at the edge of the stage as set four ended. All right, laddie, this is it. You're coming with me. I hesitated, looked at my sneakers and said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't. He grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me as, eru as he erupted, What are you, a fucking Protestant? <laughs> <laughs> the room went silent. Every officer in the place stared at me. I felt like a little kid being scolded by his father in front of his friends and teachers. I looked into Admiral McBackbuckler's eyes, and for just a second, they softened. That look told me he wasn't angry. He was lonely. I was startled. 
Even though I'd been ROTC, it hadn't occurred to me until that moment that officers were capable of being lonely. It was confusing to see them as three-dimensional people with struggles and weaknesses rather than as terminators who jogged 15 miles before 5 a.m. and ate nails for breakfast. <laughs> I held his glance and said, sir, I apologize, but I'm not under military law, I'm under Saudi law, and if they stop our van and catch me with booze on my breath, they might really hurt me. But I'd love to hang out with you if you don't mind me being sober. He was repentant, sort of. Oh, laddie, why the fuck didn't you say something, you bahooky mucklin haggis had it halfwit? <laughs> he offered a friendly hug. His vulnerability moved me, and I accepted. No bro hug business either. We embraced chest deep as though we'd spent a decade apart missing one another. The band finished our show and were sent on our sober way by a group of standing applauding officers and one very drunk Scott who acted as my personal bodyguard. <laughs> on the ride back to base, I thought of Captain McBackbuckler and shook my head in awe at his life force. Despite how he manhandled me, I was invigorated by his headlock and hug and felt like a teenager after his first real grappling match with his father. The hug I was dreaming of, though, was waiting for me with my new romance. I was grateful to know I'd see her in just a few weeks. I wondered how long it had been since my new Scottish friend had seen his loved ones, and how many other officers were as lonely as him. I remembered the DOD scout who offered the band this opportunity, and how she listened to us and my childish attempts at humor on a night she would surely rather have been with friends. And I recalled the officer who gave us sober expectations about how to behave in the Middle East, probably just to avoid Eskimo sunburn starting an international incident, and how he must have felt to have me treat him as a substitute teacher. I thought about the gracious Marine who softened my heart that night. I replayed his kind words to the band over and over and felt like a kid who'd brought home an A on his report card and watched his father beam with pride. Without warning, I saw my dad's casket in my mind and realized that as a young man and beyond, I wouldn't know the experience of making my dad proud. As the grief crashed inside me, my legs got weak, my stomach twisted, and my heart felt like it had been ripped in half. But rather than run from the feelings, I borrowed some of that Marine's courage and stared at my dad's casket and felt the buried, aching sadness in my heart swell and subside over and over until, to my surprise, I saw that Marine's family and felt compassion for how scared and exhausted they must have felt to be apart. And my heartache turned to a desire for that Marine to be home with them. And that desire grew into a heartfelt yearning for the Scott and all the other officers I'd met to be reunited with their loved ones. And that yearning grew and filled me until it was larger than my worries about myself and bigger than my shame. I smiled and for the first time in as long as I could remember, felt deeply calm. Thank you. Jim Stevens, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Stevens.